Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the lecture entitled, The Essential is Invisible, Mapping Dark Matter in the Universe. We're very honored to have Morning Psychology's distinguished visitor, Professor Priyama Dalnadarajan with us today. Professor is from the Departments of Astronomy and Physics at Yale University. She's also the Chair of Women's Faculty Forum at Yale. May I now please have Professor Sir James Merlis to share a few words. Professor Melise, please. It's a particular pleasure to introduce Professor Natharajan. Uh, I first knew her a little while ago uh, uh, when uh, in uh, our college in Cambridge, which is Trinity College, Cambridge which uh, some people believe is the center of the universe, but certainly, uh, uh, certainly Priyam Vada does not think that it is the center of the universe, and she has very sound empirical evidence to support that, uh, that view. Uh, she was a research fellow there, and she did her PhD there after she started at MIT. And uh, as, as you just heard, she is now uh, indeed, ha has been a professor at Yale for some time, and she's full professor in both the physics department and the astronomy department. Uh, I don't think that she spends much time uh, sitting at a telescope. I think she spends a lot of time sitting at a computer screen, uh, which is where you can see a lot of these things uh, much more vividly presented than if you're just looking through the, the, the business end of the, of the telescope. Uh, she has uh, been working on a whole range of things, but actually dark matter seems to be a major interest of her now. Uh, we have a series of these distinguished visitor lectures. Uh, we were aiming to have about two a year and I'm sure we'll try to make them very different subjects. But of course, you'd all be welcome to come to, to the next. Uh, in fact, we'll be having um, a Professor Neil Ferguson from Harvard in a few weeks' time, uh, which will be on something entirely different, uh, a, a, a less dark subject, perhaps, but, uh, more, but more disputable. Uh, in this case, I suspect we will be hearing maybe the truth about dark matter if anyone knows it. I look forward to this very much. Uh, please give us your lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I want to say what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be here visiting Hong Kong for the first time and visiting um, CUHK and Morningside College. Okay, without um, further ado, oh, and Jim, thank you so much for not mentioning how long ago that was. <laughs> not very long ago. Okay, so um, what I want to talk to you about today is dark matter in the universe. It turns out that the majority of matter in the universe is not made most of the stuff in the universe that we call matter is not made of ordinary atoms, the stuff that we are made of. The stuff that we are made of constitutes only 4% of the entire matter budget. The rest of it is some very exotic particle, and we don't quite know what that particle is. But what I hope you will walk away from today is a sense of this very intriguing position that we are in cosmology today which is that we know a lot about the properties of dark matter, how it clusters, where it is, how much of it there is. We know a whole lot except what it's made of. So it's a very peculiar state of affairs. But before I proceed, there are some preliminaries that I would like to spend a little bit of time on so that you know, everyone gets sort of up to speed on what we do in cosmology and why dark matter is consequential, sort of a motivation, and then I'll talk to you about where we are, the state of the art. Um, I, could we dim the lights a little bit more? Would that be possible? 
Do you want to try dimming them a little bit more, the overhead lights? <laughs> no, no, that's too much. Uh, can we go down further? Is this the best we can do? Okay. So anyway, I we could do that, um, but if that's going to prevent, um, are people going to? It's not that late. Uh, that it's not afternoon. People aren't going to fall asleep. But there's going to be times when I would like you to do that when I show some images. May I request you to come and? Sure. Ah, great. Okay. Um, so what is cosmology? So essentially, cosmology is the study of the universe, trying to understand the structure, the size, the characteristics. And characteristics, what we mean by the characteristics are the contents of the universe, what constitutes the universe. So what, there are a couple of underlying foundational principles that, um, so originally, that I want you uh, to get a hang of. So originally, it was thought by many, including Einstein, for a very long time, that the universe was static. And that no motion in the universe is, oh, I moved away, okay. Um, no motion in the universe is observed on very, very large scales. However, that is intimately tied to the question of what is the size scale of the universe? Is it finite or is it infinite? So it was thought that the universe really needed to be infinite. And I'll show you a little later how we will actually never know uh, whether the universe is finite or not for a very different reason other than the fact that we don't understand it. So if, if, a fi if the universe were finite, it would have an edge, and then if it had an edge, the material at the edge would feel the inward pull of gravity of the rest of it and would start moving in. So that's sort of, it's sort of awkward if, there was, if, the, if the universe was finite, right? But then we don't see any large scale motions, at least this was the original understanding, and therefore there's no edge, and therefore the universe has to be infinite. The reason I'm sort of giving you some of these arguments is that you'll see immediately that there are some problems with the idea of an infinite universe and of motions in the universe. And then some of the fundamental questions that have sort of helped us, flummoxed us for a very long time, and that's tied to an infinite universe, is why is the night sky dark? It's not because the sun set, right? Um, an, an infinite universe can never be dark. Why? Because every line of sight will end on the surface of a star. And so it will be as bright as the surface of a typical star. So an, inf so an infinite number of, uh, infinite universe would have an infinite number of stars and infinite starlight, and it should be infinitely bright. So if that is not the case, how do we retain the notion of the universe possibly being infinite? We want to keep that option open, right? So then how do we fix the fact that the night sky is dark? The solution is that the universe isn't infinitely old. And now we know that to be true. We have data that the universe has a finite age. And the clue to understanding the finiteness or infinite, uh, infiniteness of the universe has to do with the fact that we never quite see all parts of it. And we don't see all parts of it. We only see what's nearby for two reasons. One, the universe isn't infinitely old. It has a finite age. And the fact that light has a finite speed. Okay, so we'll come to why that's consequential in a minute. So cosmologists make a couple of assumptions about the universe, which luckily have held true. First is homogeneity, that the material in the universe, whatever the universe might be made of or constituted by, by and large, is very uniformly distributed. This does not mean that there aren't lumps here and there. But on the largest scales, it's very, very uniform. And we also make the assumption that there is as Jim rightly pointed out, the universe has no center. There is no preferred location in the universe. Every location is, as, is equivalent to every other location. So the universe looks the same to all observers, no matter where they are. So you know, we happen to be life on Earth in this little solar system. Now there are about 500 other planets discovered around other stars. So if we are optimistic, well, I'm a very optimistic person, and there could be life elsewhere, someone else making measurements of the universe would measure all the properties that we see. So the combination of these two assumptions is very potent. It's called the cosmological principle. And cosmology operates under the assumption that the universe is consistent with the cosmological principle. It turns out empirically that is true. 
And the other cornerstone, which I think is something that one doesn't appreciate unless you're actually physicists working in cosmology, is the fact that we're really lucky that the law, we make this assumption and it turns out that that is true, that the laws of physics, because we have these underlying laws, systematic correlations between observables that actually are the same everywhere. They are, they are Newton's laws are the same here or on Alpha Centauri or on the most distant galaxies that we're gonna see today, okay? And that we're really, really lucky. And the models of the universe, basic that we try to construct, have to produce a universe that follows the cosmological principles and, and has universality. Okay, so a model is a successful model if it describes all the data and it turns out, obviously that's what you do first, it turns out then we can test and see if it's consistent. And it turns out that the models that we have, and in fact the current model that best fits our universe, is one that does uh, satisfy both of those. So the universe, as I alluded to right away, um, uh, in the beginning was it's not static, it's expanding. Okay, so what does that mean? And it's very hard for us to imagine the two concepts that there is no special location in the universe and that the universe is expanding because our experience of expansion is blowing a balloon, right? So you're blowing air into a balloon and that's expanding. That is not a good analogy for the universe for two reasons. First, there's a special place where you're blowing in, right? So there's a special location from which you're blowing the balloon that's expanding. The other, th other, other thing that's incorrect about this analogy is that the balloon is expanding into air. The universe is not expanding into anything. The universe is. There is nothing beyond the universe as far as we know, okay? Uh, at least empirically. So let me try to explain then how to think about the expansion because it underpins all of cosmology. So let's imagine that that stick person is us, in one of the spiral galaxies somewhere in the universe, and what you're seeing is a slice of the universe. You're seeing a patch, there are many galaxies, and you're looking at it in a time-lapse photo. So you're looking at it, say, a million years later. And you know, forget the minor detail that the little insect and the little stick person may not live for a million years. You know, suspend, go with me on that. And what you see, notice that the galaxy B has moved its position, has moved away compared relative to the first snapshot. And notice that the galaxy A and B, A, B, C, and D, E is the farthest from the stick person, from us. And notice that it has moved the most in the time period. So there is a law that describes this motion and um, we'll just come to that in a minute and that's called Hubble's law. So the rate of expansion of the universe, the rate of expansion is the recession velocity. So things are receding away from us. The recession velocity is proportional to the distant, distance. So galaxies that are more distant from us appear to be running away faster from us than galaxies that are closer to us, okay? So the interesting thing now is that if you think this is pretty unsettling, so this is what Hubble discovered in um, 1929 or so from data by looking at nearby galaxies and mapping their speeds. So it turns out about 15 years ago, we found something even more uncomfortable. Not only is the universe expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. For those of you who have driven a car, you know that you know, you, when you accelerate, you're pushing the gas pedal, right? You're consuming a lot more fluid, petrol, gasoline, than if you're just coasting along. So you're giving some burst of energy, right? You're giving some power. So it turns out the universe has a similar mysterious energy. We don't know much about it. It's called dark energy that powers the accelerating expansion of the universe. So, um, yeah, oh, I should have mentioned one uh, very, very important thing, um, which is another um, sort of common misconception about the universe, about the Big Bang. The Big Bang did not happen in a special location. I just finished telling you, there's no special location in the universe. Even when time t equals zero, there is no special location. The Big Bang, in fact, happened everywhere in the universe. 
because that was the universe at the point. The universe started from a very dense, hot past, and it's expanded and cooled with time. So we are now 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, and we, the universe is a fairly cold place. And it was very hot, very dense, and a lot more compact very early on. So when the Big Bang, by the way, so that's another misnomer. There was no bang. There was no explosion. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I have no un idea why that term has stuck. But it was not an explosion. It was just a very hot, dense beginning. That's what the Big Bang really means. OK, so as I said, when we observe the nearby universe and it's uniformly expanding, that's what it was, was thought originally um, in the early 1900s. And Hubble found that this, this law, a linear law, was a pretty good description. And it turns out, as I just finished telling you, that now we think it's no longer a linear law. There are some correction terms. And just you know, the nearby universe appears to follow Hubble's law. And as you go further and further out, you find there are additional correction terms. For those of you who know mathematics, you're sort of adding these asymptotic terms along. And those are the terms that actually allow you to figure out that the universe is accelerating. If you didn't have those terms, if you weren't able to look as far out into the universe as we do now, you would not have been able to figure out the acceleration part. You would have figured out the expansion part, but not the acceleration part. So this is, again, just visualizing to you, um, you know, sort of rubbing it in, really, what the Hubble law means, that further objects move far away from us. OK, great. So now you're all up to speed. And I can just sort of launch into telling you what we now know about the universe and what role dark matter plays in it. So this is a visualization of the timeline of the universe. OK, so what you see, this is the dense, hot Big Bang. And the universe started expanding, and there was a period of time, I won't spend too much time on it, when it expanded exponentially, very, very rapidly. And then it's been sort of coasting along. Then the acceleration starts to pick up, and galaxies form, and we are here today. I'm not suggesting that the universe is shaped like a bell. I mean, this is just a <laughs> visualization, right? So uh, th and what th this is just showing you the timeline. So the, the age of the universe today, and this is what I mean when I say the age of the universe today. It's about 13.7 billion years since the Big Bang. And there are various stages. So notice that there's a period when nothing has formed in the universe. A, you see this sort of green patch. That's when photons, radiation from the Big Bang, we actually detect that now. It's the hiss of the Big Bang that's actually detected. And as the universe has expanded and cooled, this radiation, which was originally very hot, is now in the microwave. And it's detected everywhere in the universe. Um, it's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And what is shown here is an actual data map. So notice that we have measurements, empirical data, from when the universe for 400,000 years. Okay, so we have incontrovertible evidence for the Big Bang. So the people who try to tell you, well, the Big Bang never happened, th there is no other way in which to understand and make sense of this data that we have. So we have radiation that left the universe when the universe was 400,000 years old that is detected today. Okay? And it's detected uniformly in the sky. And this is measured to one part in 10 to the 5. Okay, very, very, so fifth decimal place measurement from when the universe for 400,000 years. OK, so let's quickly get a feel for what we are actually doing when we look out into the night skies. So when you look out into the sky, you're actually looking back in time. The reason for that is that it takes light a finite amount of time to reach us from distant objects. And so it takes light eight minutes to reach us from the sun, which is our nearest star. So by extrapolation, things are further and further away. You can imagine how long it takes light to reach us. So now we can resolve the issue of, do we really need to know, and how do we actually know how big the universe is? It turns out that the universe may, in fact, be infinite. We will never know. We will never know because there is only a finite radius out to which we can actually observe. So what I've drawn as a white line here, I don't want you to confuse 
the power of our instrumentation and technology. Okay, so the, the most powerful telescopes that we can ever build, the space telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope, that can see out to the white ring. Okay? The universe actually exists well beyond that. But it exists whether, the, whether there's anything out here, we will never know. Okay? People, if life survives on Earth for another billion years, so a few billion years later, a bigger portion of the universe will become observable. Because there would have been enough time uh, for light to have reached us from that portion of the universe. And notice I'm just showing it from the point of view of the Earth. It doesn't mean we are the center. So I just want to clarify that again and again. So any other place in the universe would have a similar observable region. So there's a, the observable region of the universe is actually finite. But whether the universe exists outside it or not is not a question that we can answer today. What we know is that a million years ago, a smaller portion was observable, and now this portion is observable. OK, so let's try and see what's happening to the universe. I showed you that picture of our current understanding. So this is the size scale of the universe. It's a measure of how big the universe is. And this is a function of cosmic time. So it turns out that the equations that describe the evolution of the universe, they are the equations that um, Einstein derived for general relativity, they depend, the past, present, future of the universe depends, and the geometry of the universe depends on the contents of the universe. So luckily for us, Einstein solutions uh, equations admit only three possible solutions. And each of these solutions are solutions for what happens to the universe as a function of time. So one solution is a solution which would be sort of, a, it would have been quite unhappy if we were on that solution. Um, that's a universe that ex continues expanding, reaches some kind of maximum size, and then closes back on itself, in on itself, collapses back. Then there are these two universes, two other solutions, two possible universe solutions, in which you're starting to expand, and then you kind of tank off, and then there's one that keeps going on forever. These will both go on forever, but this one sort of exponentially deviates from any kind of linear pattern very, very rapidly. So what is peculiar about cosmology, and I won't dwell on it very much, but something to think about, what is really bizarre is that where is today? So this is cosmic time, right? So actually today is here. We can very, very barely distinguish. And that's why it's kind of phenomenal that we actually have. So right now, we know which of these three tracks our universe is on. This is what cosmologists have been doing for the last 50 years or so. And very recently, we've been able to pin down which of these models is the best match to our universe. OK, so there's a brief, um, sort of brief description of space. And I have to give that because we'll be talking about chasing light rays in the universe. So you need to know how light rays travel. So general relativity tells us that space is warped by mass. There are kinks in space-time. And you define space-time. The universe is defined as space-time. So at any time an event occurs in the universe, you need to specify four numbers. The three spatial coordinates where that event occurred and the time. And you need to describe, uh, you need to mention the time now because it takes light a finite amount of time to reach us. So you have to mention when an event occurs. And this space-time is a fabric. One can think of it as a fabric. That's the easiest analogy, and it's a good one. The, and you can think of expansion. What is the expansion? It's pulling the sheet. It's pulling it at the edges. Actually, it's pulling it everywhere. But if you visualize it, you can think of a sheet that's being pulled out. Right? And the presence of mass, any mass causes a little bump in space-time, however small the mass is. Of course, the size of the bump depends on how massive the object is. And the presence of mass causes some curvature in space-time. So remember, I just finished telling you that Einstein's um, equations for the universe admit three solutions. And the geometry, the contents, and the fate are intricately related. That's, that was Einstein's insight. Okay? A pretty amazing insight that was. So what that, and I showed you three possible solutions. Each of those solutions corresponds, therefore, to a very specific geometry. 
So flat, a flat universe, so one of them corresponds to a flat universe in which there is no curvature really. I mean, you have masses, but by and large, on very large scales. So we're talking about the larger scales. Obviously, in the vicinity of, if I drop a mass into it, there's going to be a little bump. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a large scale universe. And that's very flat, no curvature. That's one solution. The second solution is that the universe has a positive curvature like the outside of a sphere. And that's very cool because that's a very peculiar universe. That's a universe in which if you could draw very large scale triangles, the sum of the angles would not be 180 degrees. They would exceed 180 degrees. It's a really cool geometry to have. This is not the universe we live in, unfortunately, or fortunately. So this is my favorite model, and this is not at all the universe that we live in. I like it because it's the Pringles potato chip, and I sort of have a fondness for fried potatoes, which I guess is genetic, uh, is what I gather now. So this is a universe that has a negative curvature. It's shaped like a saddle. So these are, this is it. This is it. So now you know all the solutions to Einstein's equations. Basically, you have those three possibilities for the size scale and the three corresponding geometries. And as I said, the whole goal of cosmology is to figure out which solution, and I finished telling you, we know which solution we are on. Okay? The reason why do we need to know which solution we are on, because how light rays are going to travel in the universe is the paths are intricately de are connected to the geometry of the universe. Okay? okay, so what do we know about the universe? So, this is our current understanding. I want you to focus on this pie chart here. So we think this is the energy density of the universe. So the contents, the total energy, the total mass density of the universe. Remember, for a cosmologist, mass and energy are interchangeable. Okay? E equals mc squared. So I go back and forth between mass and energy. So what we know is our universe, our uncomfortable universe, 73% of it is this mysterious force that we know nothing about. It's called dark energy. And dark matter is about 23%. And this dark matter, which is 23%, as I said, it's not ordinary matter. Ordinary matter is just a little sliver. So mostly hydrogen. Most of the universe is hydrogen, right? And, and this includes all of us, everything that we are made of. We've all come out of the first stars, which were cr processed all the uh, metals. So, you know, I think there are astronomers who very romantically say that we're all made of stardust. We literally are made of stardust. Um, because the metals that were made that are part of our bodies, like calcium, they were all synthesized in the centers of supernovae. Okay? But they're a tiny fraction of the total contents of the universe, just 4%. So the majority of the matter in the universe is this very peculiar kind of matter. It's exotic in the sense it's not ordinary atoms. And it's exotic for some other reason, is that it is collisionless. It's made of these particles, which we think were made very early in the universe at some point. So we have some candidates for what dark matter could be. And these particles are such that they interact so weakly that if I were to collide two dark matter particles, they would kind of just go through each other. They wouldn't bounce back like billiard balls. They don't bounce back and they don't, they don't collide and transfer energy to each other. The only interaction that dark matter has is gravity because they have mass. So the only thing that they can do in the universe is lump. So they lump in the universe because of gravity. Okay? And they lump by different amounts in different parts of the universe. So let's see, what is the evidence for dark matter in the universe? So let me lead you through what are the most compelling arguments. So again, you know, there, there, there's incontrovertible proof for dark matter. What is disputed is what it's made of, because we haven't detected it yet, okay? But there is no dispute on the properties. So this is, again, close to home. This is our solar system. And some of you could probably um, can notice that I'm one of those people who still wants Pluto to be a planet. I haven't removed it from my slides. I, I signed the petition. So they polled all of us, uh, astronomers and astrophysicists. What do you think? Should Pluto be a planet? And I voted yes, uh, as did a lot of my colleagues. Um, so it turns out, when we look at the solar system, so the sun has, is the gravitationally dominant body. It's the most dominant body in the solar system. And the speeds of planets around the sun, right? So Mercury has the shortest orbit. It's moving the fastest around the sun. As you go further out, things really slow down, right? So Pluto takes a very, very long time to go around the sun. 
So if I then plot the velocity or the speed with which a planet is moving around the sun, this is the plot that you get as a function of distance from the sun. So objects like Mercury, Venus, very close to the sun are moving very rapidly, and Pluto is moving very, very slowly, is the farthest, right? So what does this tell you? This tells you when you have this kind of dependence that the gravity in the solar system is provided, the most of the mass of the solar system is provided by the sun. Okay? So things that are closest to it, gravitational force falls off as 1 over r squared, as Newton showed us. So that holds very nicely. And you say, oh, this is great. OK, let me apply the same arguments to a galaxy. So now, instead of planets, I have stars. So the center of the galaxy will define the brightest point in the galaxy. There are lots of stars going all the way out. And this is a galaxy. This is called the Sombrero Galaxy. You know, we can never have such a view of our own galaxy, right? Because we're sitting in the middle of it. So this is a nearby galaxy that looks rather like ours. Okay? So let's measure, and now we can. We measure the speeds. We could do this actually from the 1970s. Measure the speeds of stars as a function of distance from the center of a galaxy. So let me explain one more time. This is the same galaxy we just saw. And we're looking at a top view now. So it's a spiral galaxy. And this is looking top down. And that was a sideways view, right? So what we are trying to do is just like the solar system argument, we are trying to plot the speeds of stars as a function of radius, OK? And now I want to pause for a minute and let you all make up your mind as to what do you think we see. This is what we see. It's completely different from what we see for the solar system. So what's the explanation? So the explanation, what's really going on here, is that whatever is contributing gravity that's holding a galaxy together is distributed in such a fashion that the dominant part is not in the center. And there's a lot of mass going all the way out. And it turns out that this distance, and notice it's thousands of light years, so going really quite the ways out. So if I go back to the image that I had, so this is going out to here. So this is light years across, right? So the, when you go out, so a star that's orbiting the center of this galaxy at this distance from it is actually moving quite fast. And it's flat, so if you notice, so this, this graph is called the rotation curve of a galaxy. Now, uh, what we are finding, so there's a region where it sort of peaks, and then it kind of is really flat. And the only way you can have that, the only possible mass distribution that would allow this is something where there's a lot of matter that has gravity that's sitting at the outskirts. And it turns out that now, through the dust, if you remember seeing that image of the galaxy, it's a lot of dust. So it turns out that you, know, you can measure the speeds of stars. There's a lot of hydrogen gas that is sitting that you don't see in this image that extends outside where you see the starlight. And you can measure the speed of gas, too, and you find that it's pretty flat. Okay, so now this is measured. So as far as, out, uh, as, far out as we can measure, it sits flat. So this means that we have a lot of unseen matter at very large radius in galaxies. So you may say, well, maybe that's one peculiar. It's not. Every galaxy that we can make such measurements out of, notice it's sort of, sometimes you know, you sort of, it's doing a little funny things, but basically you're very, very flat. And if it's doing anything funny, it's actually in a more uncomfortable direction than a comfortable direction. Mean, it's still kind of tanking and taking off. So basically, it's very, very flat. And these, the COH1 tells you what you're using. So this is um, carbon. This is, an, um, this is one of the um, isotopes of carbon. This is hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, that you can measure further out. And you find, basically, that it's flat. So what is the conception of a galaxy? This is what we think a galaxy like our own looks like, which is that the starlight that you see is a very small portion of the center. It's a little beacon in the center. The, the gray, the dark gray, is hydrogen gas that exists, um, that exists well outside where you see starlight. And in fact, the conception is that now we have dark matter that's distributed all the way from the center outwards. There's a lot of it sitting outside. And that every galaxy has some kind of dark matter halo. Of course, it turns out in the universe, it's not so clean. The galaxies don't quite have such a clean edge as I've drawn this cartoon. They kind of ooze out into a larger, smeared distribution of dark matter. 
So this is what our galaxy would look like. For those of you wondering, okay, so what, do, what does our galaxy look like? So you have this region of very, very dense, densely populated stars that's called the bulge, and you have something called the thin disk of stars, you have the thick disk of stars. That's where we are, by the way, so that's the sun. We're offset from the center quite a bit. And this is the dark matter halo of our galaxy. So you may wonder, is there dark matter in this room? Yes, but it is so lightly smeared that at the distance of the solar system even, there's very, very little dark matter. So there are experiments underway now on Earth trying to detect these dark matter particles and the rates, so you, know, you can calculate if you're sitting with a detector, how often are you gonna be hit by a dark matter particle, the rates are very piddly, unfortunately. There are no detections yet, no direct detections. And I can answer later on uh, what that rate is and so on. So this is what inspired the title of my talk, the most essential part of the universe, as in life, right? The most important things are always invisible. They're not obviously apparent. So, okay, if the conception of an individual galaxy is that it has a dark matter halo, and then I said, well, there's no edge to galaxies, they kind of smear. So this is what the dark matter distribution of the universe looks like. So this is a slice of the universe, and this is about six million light years by six million light years. And what you see here, it's mocked up to look like light. These are not stars. These are just the densest parts. These are the regions, though, where galaxies will form. Okay, so the intersection of these filaments. So um, for those of you who might be a biologist, this looks exactly like a neuron. Okay, these look like dendrites, and so it's, it's, it's quite remarkable, the structural uh, resemblance. It really has to do with, um, and it's not a coincidence, by the way. So a, any uh, kind of aggregation process, which is ruled by a one over r squared, will end up in something like this. So gravity is the only dominant force in the universe. So electromagnetic forces, strong forces, weak forces, are not really relevant at all for dark matter. D gravity is the only thing that matters. So this is a simulation done by some colleagues of mine, um, your Diamant and others, and what you're going to see here is how dark matter aggregates and how it lumps in the universe. As I said, the only thing that matters, we believe what happened in the very early universe is that you had a sea, a uniform sea of dark matter in which there were very small fluctuations. And the fluctuations are small piles. It's like a little sand pile. So they were very small piles which over time just aggregated, got amplified, became bigger and bigger and more and more massive. So what you're seeing here, marked in the yellow, are actually, everything is dark matter here. There's no, there's no stars, there's no gas, there's no baryons. Baryons is the fancy way to say ordinary atoms, everything that we're made of, right? This is all dark matter. And what you see is, uh, in this film, we saw how one of the most massive structures in the universe that we know about formed. And this structure is called clusters of galaxies. So every yellow point that you see in this image is a region where in the universe, so this, is, this would all be unseen, what would you see? You would see these yellow bits and they would be individual galaxies. So such an object in the universe is called a cluster of galaxies and as you can see, most of it is dark matter. The pink stuff is dark matter, it's just lightly smeared dark matter, not as lumpy, not as blobby. There are lots of blobs of dark matter, and the densest parts of the blobs of dark matter are the places where gas will form stars, will form galaxies. So you would see structure that has formed. And the way structure forms, I don't think this movie is actually gonna work. So what this movie would have shown you if it had worked was how actually in those yellow regions you actually form stars, okay? And the way gas falls in and forms stars. Now, let's quickly move on to one of the very, very powerful ways in which we have mapped and understood the distribution of dark matter. And that is the discovery of light deflection by matter. So now you know where we are in the universe. We know we live in a lumpy, clumpy universe where both dark matter is very lumpy. You have space-time that is going to be warped by all these lumps of dark matter. 
So every lump of dark matter. So you can think, so I think the way I think about it, so you know, I live in the East Coast of the United States, and we have this horrible highway, which is called I-95, full of potholes. And that's really what we have. So the universe is full of potholes, and these potholes are created by mass in space-time. I mean, dignifying I-95 and calling it space-time. Uh, it really is quite a horrendous road, um, highway. So, Light rays, because remember, space-time is the universe. So light has no way to go but to go up and down every pothole. And the interesting thing is that every pothole that light has encountered is encoded in it. We'll figure out how it's encoded in just a minute. And the reason it's encoded is because light gets deflected. Every time it gets deflected because space-time has a, has a warp, has a little kink and light travels down it, and it follows that kink. It follows that pothole. So Solner, in 1804, actually calculated. Remember, this was, so this is, this is really path-breaking, because in 1804, people thought that light was only waves. They didn't know quantum mechanics. They didn't know that particles and waves are the same. So it was a completely different understanding, OK? And still, he figured out that waves, when they encounter little bumps, they didn't know about space-time either, because GR didn't happen till Einstein in 1915 came up with the theory. So there was no notion of space-time. So they were just thinking of media. All they knew at the time in 1804 was what Newton knew, right? Which is going from air to a prism, which is glass, light gets bent, right? You've all done that experiment of splitting light. So Solner actually calculated what that deflection angle, and he figured out that it might have to do with the material in which light is traveling. Except it turns out light, unlike sound, doesn't need material to travel in. It can travel in vacuum, right? But that wasn't quite discovered at that point. So it's, it's really remarkable that he had a calculation. He had a calculation of how the light would be deflected. It turns out that, of course, you know, in time, Einstein came up with general relativity and figured out, you know, what is, what I find quietly stunning about it is that it's only a factor of two off. You remember the universe, all these numbers are gargantuan, right? Factor of two is really nothing. And given the amount of understanding and progress that was made. So, and, um, so this is a very interesting Cambridge connection. In 1917, Sir Arthur Eddington led an expedition to the solar eclipse and went to South Africa and measured the light deflection. And, and he confirmed Einstein's result. I'll tell you what he confirmed in just a minute. This is what he confirmed. So in a solar eclipse, you have a solar eclipse because the sun lines up along Earth nicely, right? And what you end up seeing, right, so there's a star that happens to line up just behind the sun along the Earth. So during a solar eclipse, it turns out you think you see the star here. Okay. Why is that? During a solar eclipse, the presence of the sun and the earth here causes an unusually large bump in space time. Right? So light, light rays that travel from this star here, which is actually there, get bent. And so you, in, in, you end up seeing and thinking that the star is actually here. And then when the eclipse is over, the sun has moved on. Space-time is back, not as warped as before, and you see where the star is, it's actually there. So the actual star was there and you thought it was here, right? This angle, this is the deflection angle that people were predicting. This is the one that Solner got off by a factor of two, that Einstein got correct uh, and this, by this measurement. So this was the measurement that the eclipse experiment actually made of that angle. So it is this angle that we're going to call the deflection angle or the bending angle. It's the light bending angle. So this is a visualization of what's really happening to light from stars that are distant when you have the sun sort of around the sun. So you see the apparent position of the star is this, where the true position is that. Because when you see the deflected thing and then you try to figure out where the light rays came from, you imagine that it's actually here, but the real position is here. Light ray has, it's been bent because it's going through warped space time. So this is a very nice visualization of how to think about light traversing large distances in the universe. And we can think of light as bundles. 
And we want to think about it as bundles because what, is, what do I mean by light? We're actually seeing distant galaxies. That's what light is in the universe. Right? It's the stars that are emitting light in distant galaxies. And we just saw that you have dark matter everywhere. You have dark matter in these filaments. You have, you have dark matter halos around all the galaxies. There are many galaxies along the line of sight to us, right? So the light bundle, I'm now chasing this light bundle from one of these distant blue galaxies, right? And this light bundle is bending. So when I come, when I look out on the observed sky, in regions where there's a lot of this black stuff, which is dark matter, visualized to be dark matter, so there's a region where I have a cluster of galaxies. Remember, that's what we saw forming in that simulation, which is a lot of dark matter. There's a lot of light bending. What's the consequence? The consequence is that you do not see the real shapes of galaxies. You see distorted shapes. So a galaxy that, so this is just to give you an idea of the configuration of what's going on in the universe. So what you have are distant galaxies, and there are many galaxies along, all along, right? So we're looking at a distant patch, there's a screen of distant galaxies, light from them is getting bent. You have a cluster of galaxies here, which has a lot of dark matter, and it's bending light. So that's what we are measuring. So this is sort of the configuration. So what we are measuring are the shapes of these guys, okay? So for those of you who want to feel that they got some physics out of this talk, uh, just have one slide with an equation because it's a very simple equation. It's super elegant. So what's elegant about this equation? This is the equation that Einstein figured out. This is the deflection angle. So delta theta is that deflection angle that you just saw in the eclipse experiment slide. So it's this angle. And what is powerful about that equation is that it's very simple. There only it's a product of two terms and the first term is the mass, the intervening mass that is causing the bending, okay? And in fact, it's actually all the mass that is along the line of sight. But it turns out that when you think about clusters of galaxies, they are rare objects. So if you see a cluster that acts as a lens and bends light, then it's the mass of the cluster that you are measuring. And you can see that's how we are determining how much dark matter there is. Because you see all the visible stars, you subtract them out, and you find that you're off by 90% given the light deflection. What it takes to deflect light as far as it's deflected is 90% more than what you see, and it has to be dark matter. Okay, so the other nice thing about it um, is, since I've told you so much about geometry and contents and um, eulogizing Einstein. So what is really nice about this equation is that this term, these ratio of two Ds, these, these are what are called the dia angular diameter distances in the universe. And they have to do with the geometry of the universe. So whether you're flat, a Pringle chip, or sphere, this is where it comes in, okay? So it turns out that if you can measure deflections, and suppose you know the geometry of the universe. I told you that we now know the geometry of our universe. We know the content, we know the geometry. So what we can do now is measure the masses of objects that are causing the deflection. And these objects that cause the very, very large deflections are clusters of galaxies. And they are huge repositories of dark matter. So there's one other beautiful, peculiar, <coughs> mind-boggling thing about light travel in the universe. So let's go back to this slide. So it turns out that if there are very, very massive objects, you can think of this light beam, a very, very massive object will cause a huge deflection, so a huge pothole in space-time. And it sometimes it can be so dramatic that you can split a light beam into two. A single light beam will split into two. What does that mean? What it means is that if you have a very massive object that is lensing, that is defocusing, that is deflecting light, you could end up seeing two images of the object when there's in reality only one object. How do you know there are two images of the same object? You go and take out, take the spectrum. They're identical. So light has been split from, light from one object has gotten split into two so that it appears that there are two objects. Actually, it turns out that there's a theorem, it's a mathematical theorem, that you always form an odd number of images. 
So it turns out there is a third image here. It's a very demagnified, tiny image sitting in the center of these two, which is very, very hard to find. So it turns out that the light beam can be split, and you can get multiple images, and they're seen. So again, there's a Cambridge connection here. So in 1979, Bob Coswell, who is at the Institute of Astronomy, one of my professors there, was the guy who discovered the first double-imaged quasar in the universe. Remember, it's not just any object that emits light can be lensed. So it doesn't have to be a galaxy. Much of what I'm going to be talking to you today about are galaxies, but a quasar is very bright. So a, it's a source of light, and that can be imaged, multiply imaged, and it's lensed, and it's deflected. So you may wonder, so when do you multiply image? When does the light beam actually split? It turns out that you need a perfect degree of alignment. And you've all used the expression, right? The stars have to align. Absolutely. Damn well they need to. So if they align perfectly, you see very, very special configurations. So if you have a distant object, a galaxy or a quasar, and you have a very massive lens that's causing a huge bump in space-time, light rays from this object, if things line up, and we are here on Earth, an observatory making these measurements, if things really line up just right, remember, just like the solar eclipse case, if things line up just right, you will end up seeing an image on the sky of the source that is originally an individual source stretched out into a ring. So it's all mangled, and it becomes a big ring. Just as you can see multiple objects. Sometimes you can see multiple copies. Sometimes you see it all pulled out and smeared into a ring. So if, if it's an object that is like a quasar, like a point source of light, not a very extended source like a galaxy, then you'll end up seeing multiple images. Okay? But you need alignment. You need perfect alignment. So when things are not so aligned, so this is just, this is just to show you how well we understand all of this now. So this is, a, this is a plot from one of my papers, um, which what these colored circles show you are if, you, if there is a circular galaxy, a distant circular galaxy, that we are viewing through a cluster lens. So you have a cluster lens that is in between us and the distant galaxy. And suppose the original shape was circular, right? What would we see? What would the lensing do? What would the distortion make it look like? Instead of seeing it as a circle on the sky, we would see it, we'd see four copies. We'd see all the stuff that is blue, the corresponding to the location of blue. You'd see these very elongated arc-like structures, and you'll see one itly, itly, itly piddly piece. And they're all identical copies. I mean, they are the same galaxy, okay? But you see that split into four. And remember, you see this demagnified little guy in the center, which is very hard to actually find. But then, as you can see, it's about alignment, right? Everything is about alignment. So the red guy is perfectly aligned with the lens and us, and you see four copies. This is called an Einstein cross. And as you move further out, this yellow shape, you get a one very elongated guy, one, and you get a counter image, which is not as elongated, a little blip. And when you're green, remember, you get just this one little arc. Notice that the green guy, there's no counterpart. It's not doubly imaged. It's just sheared. Okay. So the regime where this happens, where you don't make multiple copies, is called a weak lensing regime. And the regime where you split the light beam and make multiple copies is called the strong lensing regime. Okay. So you see, this is an observed Einstein ring. This is the first um, Einstein ring. So this is, remember the case when I said everything lines up and you have a galaxy that is imaged and stretched out. One image, it's stretched out into a ring. You may say, ah, you see all these configurations. So these are, these are all cases where you have an individual galaxy that is lensing another galaxy. So now we're going to take a bold jump, and we're going to look at lenses that are extremely massive. So this is one that um, I recently reconstructed. So this is what I actually do. So what I do is I look at the distorted shapes of galaxies. And I know what the lens, and I partition, I figure out. So this is what we see. So this is the image that we see. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a very distant galaxy. And that is stretched out. Not quite a ring, but so the alignment is not perfect, but near perfect. Doesn't quite close. So the question is, what is the original shape of this galaxy? So people like me, so this 
a bunch of us have developed these methodologies of how to figure out what the undistorted shape of this galaxy was if we know the mass of this galaxy. So as I said, this lens is quite massive and the covering fraction, so when you look out into the night sky, not a lot of patches of the sky are covered in these objects, very massive things. So you actually have places which give you undistorted views. So you statistically know what the distribution of shapes of galaxies. We know the shapes that galaxies are born with that are not distorted. So when I go and see one that is extremely distorted, I can statistically figure out what is the most likely undistorted shape because in general, I know what the undistorted shapes of most galaxies look like. I have a distribution, okay? And what, what you do in the process, so you're chasing these light rays, you, you do what's called ray tracing, you map all the light rays back and forth in space time, then you figure out how massive this object needs to be. And so you figured out, then it's a galaxy, I see the starlight, and I know how massive it has to be to give me the deflection that I see, and it turns out when I go add all the masses of the stars that I see, that's only 10%. 90% is missing, and that's dark matter. So as I said, I want to now talk, jump right into what I think are, so is the frontier at the moment with lensing. And that is looking at lensing by the biggest, the sort of oomphiest lenses in the universe. And they are clusters of galaxies. So they are a thousand galaxies that are held together by the gravity of dark matter. So only 1% of the total mass of a cluster is all the stars in all the galaxies, tiny. Okay? And 10% is hot gas that glows in the x-rays. So when you go out into the night sky and look in the visible, you're never going to see this gas. You need an x-ray detector to go actually detect. I mean, it's like going to the doctors, right? You don't see your bones. It's only when you do an x-ray, you don't see the skin anymore. You see the bones. So very much like that in the universe, depending on the light that you're using to probe, you will see very different views of the universe. So clusters have 10% of the mass in hot gas. The rest is dark matter. So the question is, how much mass in the universe is distributed in these clusters? How much mass does an individual cluster have? And how is it distributed? Does it look anything like my a priori computer simulation of a theoretical calculation that I showed you? So when I, when I was, um, I started this work right after my thesis and got very excited because I figured out how to map mass and I thought, oh great, you know, now I'm going to become very famous because I'm going to find out that this doesn't match the theory, because that's what we want, right? We want to show that the theory is in trouble. Um, and so if the data can show that this theory is in super trouble, then I'm all set, right? I mean, I'm really, I should be like walking to Stockholm. Alas, it turns out <laughs> the theory is correct. It's incredible how correct it is. And I think I alluded to you that one part in 10 to the five so this is what a cluster, so what I have here is a screen of galaxies that are all spherical. And the presence, uh, don't worry about the fact that it's moving, that's just because I had to show you an animation of the, the range of shapes. So normally when you go out into this night sky, a cluster is sort of static, it's a static lens that is lensing the background. So these are all background distant galaxies that have originally circular. And what you end up seeing, notice they're all stretched out, and you can see, you can tell the cluster is basically here, the bulk of the mass of the cluster is here, and as you go out here, space-time is not as warped, so you're looking, you s these are closer to circular, right? This is a simulation. Okay, so I should march along. Um, so this whole field has gotten transformed by the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is one of those distorted arcs, which is a very distant galaxy that has been bent out of shape by a cluster that is sitting in front. This is what the image from the ground looks like. This is the Canada France Hawaii telescope. And this is what the Hubble Space Telescope allows. This is the same guy that you see here. Notice the difference, it's incredible. So the other thing with the Hubble Space Telescope, because of the remarkable resolution, you can find all those itsy bitsy counter images. Remember in the theory I was showing you, you should find a counter image here. You find all of them. So this is, I want the lights off now completely. Um, so this is the image of a very massive cluster. You are seeing only 10% of the mass of this. Because you're seeing galaxies and the stars, the yellow stuff in the cluster. And these are the distant galaxies that are behind the cluster, which are getting completely bent out of shape. 
seeing these arcs and arclets, right? This looks like all those theoretically predicted ones. This is how exquisitely we can study them. It turns out there's something quite amazing about lensing, which I haven't dwelt on, which is that lensing magnifies faint objects. Lens, that's why it's called a lens. Okay, it magnifies. So this is a galaxy, and I'm showing you this particular one. This is the, this is the knot that you see there. We can study it in detail. This is a galaxy that we will never, ever, ever be able to build a telescope powerful enough to see, ever. Okay, so uh, the lens, the cluster lens is bringing such objects into view. Okay, so we can actually study it incredibly well. I can tell you how, what is the rate of star formation in this knot. How many grams are being converted into stars? How many grams of gas is getting converted into stars? That's the kind of detailed study you can do of objects that you wouldn't normally see. And as I said, these are not you know, one rare object. There are many clusters of galaxies. They're rare, but there are plenty of them. This is a spectacular one in which you have a galaxy that's shaped like a cartwheel and that's imaged into five. And we have actually found the demagnified image here. It's one of those rare cases where we do see the demagnified guy where it should be. So the, again, you can do very detailed studies. So these are all distant galaxies that we would never ever see unless serendipitously they hadn't lined up just behind this cluster. So we can study in detail what their properties look like, how old these guys. So this is my favorite cluster. I like to joke and I call it the Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie of clusters. It's much photographed. It's however not the most important object to me. The most interesting and intriguing object I'll, I'll end the talk with. But this is the first Hubble Space Telescope image of a cluster that was this spectacular. So you know, the graphics are quite nice, but you know, on the computer screen you can see much better that there are more than a hundred galaxies that are behind this cluster that have been distorted into these arcs. So these are all gravitationally lensed arcs. You can see some around here. So you can immediately, now from what you've learned so far, you can see already where is the mass concentrated, where is dark matter concentrated in this cluster? Here and actually here, because look, you're seeing things that are getting bent around here. So there are two big lumps of dark matter, right? So what do people like me do? This is what I do, which is I have now plotted, this is the same cluster of galaxies. Okay, so this is the massive one large mass, this is the second mass, and this is, it's flipped here. So this is the large mass, this is the secondary mass, and this is an equipotential. So I am plotting the bump in space time that this cluster is creating and I'm looking down the bucket. Okay, so these are equipotentials. These are lines of equal mass. Sorry, I'm really butterfingered with the laser here. So this is the deepest part of the potential. So I'm looking up from down into this well, and this is the deepest part of the well that corresponds to the most massive bit of the cluster that is causing the biggest pothole in space-time. So that's what I'm plotting here, right? And that's what I do. So I worked uh, about 10 years ago, we figured out these ways to how to map dark matter. So what is overplotted here, you are seeing the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, these are all the cluster galaxies. These are, these are part of the lens. These big red circles that you see are lumps of dark matter. So notice that that's the galaxy. And my calculation allows me to figure out that there's dark matter out to where I see the red line. So I've mapped and I have an inventory of every lump and So another way to visualize this is like this rather than a bucket. This is a better view, a three-dimensional view. So this is how dark matter is piled up in this cluster. The height of this spike here tells you how much dark matter there is. And so the dark matter is distributed in two lumps. Remember, this is the second lump that we saw in the image. This is the first lump. Notice there are two things happening. There's a smooth distribution of dark matter. There's this like mound, and then on top of it, you have a lot of lumps. So it turns, this is when I said, you know, checking the theory. So the theory predicts how many lumps we should have from that movie that you saw, how many number, and what the masses of those lumps are. And it turns out it matches exquisitely with cold dark matter. So this is um, a recent um, map of dark matter 
for, of a cluster that one of my students, current PhD students, has just produced. This is another cluster. This is that cluster where I show you, you see these cartwheel shaped five images. So we've reconstructed the dark matter distribution. This is the same region, reconstructed the dark with all the peaks and valleys. Okay. So this is what we do. So by chasing paths of light rays from these distant galaxies, we can make these dark matter maps. So this is the deepest image ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a cluster. And this object is called 1689. And there's a reason why this is cluttered with all these numbers. So this lens, you can see there are all these dramatic arcs. This is the most powerful known lens in the universe. And it has distorted 400 galaxies. So what you see in numbers are 400 of those pairs and multiples all identified. Okay. This, this cluster has the most exquisite mass distribution derived. So one cute thing about it is that you may say, ah, how do we know, do we know, can you predict which regions of the lens are going to split the light beam and give you multiples? It turns out that, yes, we can. So let me just go back to Abel 2218. So you see this yellow bunny rabbit, right? So the, every, the portion of the sky that you view through the yellow bunny rabbit Every background galaxy, these little blue dots are background galaxies behind the lens, they are going to get multiply imaged. Okay? And everything that is behind, that's going to be imaged into five. Everything that's behind the bigger yellow region is going to get imaged in three. Okay? So we can actually precisely calculate how many, what the region is, what portion of the lens is going to split the light beam. So that's what this thick yellow line is. And the reason why this cluster is spectacular, this is a huge region that gets multiply imaged. It's a huge region of the sky behind it. I mean, it's a small patch of sky, but it's pretty large. Everything that is inside this viewed in the background gets multiply imaged. So this is that cluster. And what you see here in blue is the reconstructed dark matter map. So what you see on the sky is this. What is really there is this. Okay? So I think I will stop here and end up telling you that the essential is really invisible. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll now proceed to the Q&A session. You're welcome to ask Professor any question. Oh, thank you for your uh, talk. Uh, I, would I would like to ask that uh, we do not know what uh, dark matter really is. Mm -hmm. So how can we identify that maybe a particle is, a pa is dark matter? That's a great question. So what we know, because we know what portion of the mass density of the universe has to be composed of this dark matter, we actually know that it has to be particles in some range of mass, right? So because remember, we know the clock of the universe very, very well. So for s something that is smeared in the way that it is today, you need to have made it in huge quantities at a particular time in the universe. Okay? And it turns out that by matching how much you see today and how much you infer there to have been, we can figure out how much should have been made. Right? And that tells you already that constrains particle physics theories. And so we have candidates of particles. We know roughly when they should have formed in the universe and how much, of, you know, how, how much, um, how much mass has to be locked up in these particles. So the leading contender, one of the leading contenders for what dark matter could be is called the neutralino. And you might have all heard of the excitement with the Higgs boson. Okay, so the Higgs boson is not dark matter, but the Higgs boson was a missing piece in particle physics whose existence ratifies a particular model called the standard model. And that model implies the existence of the neutralino. So 
a neutralino is a very good possibility for dark matter, is what we think right now. So the way we are going to discover it, we think potentially, is that direct detection experiments. There are people who have been waiting. Uh, I'll tell you very briefly because it's kind of a really cool thing. So if you know crystals, you can think of crystals that have a very regular structure. So you can think of them as springs, right? As little um, zones that have springs connected to them. And when you heat a crystal, you're jiggling these springs. You're making those bonds weaker, right? Similarly, when a particle hits through, you will jiggle the spring. It's literally like you know, a spring that you're jiggling. And what people are waiting to find is they use these pure crystals, germanium crystals, very pure crystals, and they're waiting for a dark matter particle to go through that will jiggle the crystal. So that's what they're waiting for. And you need to make, have a lot of it. So you have huge amounts of germanium, pure germanium, or you can also have noble gases, so argon, xenon, et cetera. And you can see how they will get, those atoms could get jiggled. So as of yet, there is no detection. But it's a very tough experiment. It's a very, very hard experiment because switching a light on and off in the lab will cause a jiggle. So we need to be able to separate out all those potential foreground events from the real signal. So Separating the signal from the noise is very challenging, um, and, but there's no detection yet. And the rate of dark matter uh, particles passing through Earth is really tiny, just very, very low rate. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, if I may commend you for your choice of profession. <laughs> Couldn't be more Thank interesting you. and more beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I take it, I mean, I was going to ask a question, it's almost answered, but just to, to, to make sure that I'm understanding, uh, my question would be, or is, whether it is assumed, expected, theorized, that there is a connection, some kind of equivalence between dark matter and matter. So we know that dark matter is not matter, it's not made of atoms and all that, but uh, do you believe, is it believed, that there is some kind of transition that dark matter under sufficient gravity or whatever created by itself concentrates and becomes uh, uh, atoms and stars and all that? Or are they completely separate? Completely There's separate. a Chinese wall between them. There is more than a Chinese wall between them. There's a fundamental difference between, so you know, when we talk about a constituent, so if we think about a gas, right, um, we can define what is called an equation of state for any kind of matter, right? And for a gas, for example, is the Boyle's law, Charles' law, which is PV equals NRT. The pressure and the volume are related to the temperature. And what that tells you is that if you put gas particles in a box, in a container, they will collide they, and they get pressure. They have pressure because they collide against the container. They collide with each other, they collide with the walls of the container, and there's pressure. So if one thinks, therefore, of the way to define a state of matter by the equation of state, then that for gases is that, uh, ordinary atoms is that. For dark matter, it's P equals zero. So it's fundamentally different. So there's no pressure. There's only gravity for these particles. They interact very, very weakly. Um, as far as we know, they're not charged, so they don't even have electromagnetic forces uh, of attraction. Um, we think that they um, are created in, in the early universe, and they may have this one interaction which is called a very weak interaction. Um, but that's very, very hard to detect. And so all dark matter really does is aggregate due to gravity. So the only way in which it is similar to matter is that it has mass. That's about the only similarity, that, and it ends there. Mm -hmm. And there is no way in which uh, dark matter actually couples. So that's sort of the technical. It doesn't couple in any way to matter. It's only gravity. So the way galaxies form is kind of simple. So basically dark matter gives the scaffolding provides the scaffolding of the entire universe, and gas, ordinary matter, which is totally decoupled from it, it just follows it gravitationally. So dark matter lumps, and where there's a very big, very massive, dense lump, gas will flow in there into that bucket, and it will form stars, and it will form galaxies. So that's the only relationship, <laughs> that they trace each other. The distribution traces each other. And that you must have guessed already, right? Because I said, here's a galaxy, there are stars in the center, and there's dark matter. So there's a correlation. A correla but the correlation is a consequence of gravity. The fact that both of them have mass, and they have gravity, and that the dark matter dominates the mass budget of the universe. 
So it makes these very, very massive, deep gravitational potential wells, these wells or these little warps in space-time, and gas, ordinary gas, flows into that well, sits there, cools, makes stars, and forms a galaxy. Mm -hmm. So that's really where the relationship... Um, May I have a follow-up question? Uh, if you had given the opposite answer, I would assume that there would be that correlation, the correlation did you say, that correlation would be quite systematic so that you always have clouds of dark matter with, with galaxies inside. But given that there is no association... Uh, no, no, but no, no, I'm saying that there is a... Can I assume that there, that there are clouds of dark matter out in space without galaxies? Absolutely, okay. that's a great question. So there's been a lot of time and energy devoted in terms of forests burn, uh, people, theorists writing papers, of whether you could have dark galaxies. Could you, have da could you have lumps of dark matter that never actually hosted? They were hostile, they didn't host any gas, and no stars formed. And it turns out that we haven't detected one, they should be there. Theoretically, they should be there. So if you remember the movie, there was this smeared um, dark matter in pink, and then there were some red plate, some sort of blobs in blue that didn't have any yellow pixels in them that have, so there should be lots of blobs of dark matter floating around in the universe that have not succeeded in hosting galaxies and stars. We haven't detected them directly. There is only one way to detect them, lensing. That's why there's no other way you would find them, which is why this is the most powerful, beautiful uh, phenomenon. Um, and you know, uh, and it it really does have, um, yeah. I mean, I I just absolutely love this technique. So the other thing that's amazing about this technique is that the deflection angle equation that I showed you. Remember, I said that one term is proportional to the mass, so it allows you to map dark matter. So suppose you knew how much mass dar is in dark matter, it actually allows you to map the geometry of the universe. That's how powerful this technique is. You can do both. Uh, and mathematically, you know, right? I can simultaneously optimize. Right? That's not a problem. And so now we have the data that's good enough to be able to simultaneously optimize. And guess what? Still, the universe model that we have is correct. It gives the right geometry and the right dark matter. And so we published that result in science two years ago with this cluster. So this is the kind of data that we need, exquisite data in order to be simultaneously map the dark matter and map the pothole in space-time that this is creating. And we can do, I mean, but not just what this is creating, but all along the pathway, because these pathways are billions of light years long, and that is the, remember when I talked about geometry, I said it's not just local bumps, it's large-scale geometry. Those solutions that we talked about to Einstein's equations are the large-scale shape of space, not the local space of shape. The local space will always have little wrinkles, right? Because there are masses. Every, even the sun is going to make a little pothole. So that's not what we're talking about when you say the large-scale space of shape. But lensing is the most powerful and beautiful technique because it allows you to get at both the contents and the geometry of the universe in one go. Hi, so your talk thus far has given us a sense for the influence that dark matter has had on the development of the universe up to this point in time. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that you could just briefly discuss um, where the universe goes from here, and I was hoping you could actually bring dark energy into the picture as well, yep. because earlier in the talk you were showing the distribution of, um, we'll call it normal mass versus dark matter versus dark energy um, among the picture of the universe that we've seen thus far. And dark energy hasn't really come into the discussion. I understand it, it doesn't seem to have as much to do with gravitational lensing, um, but I was hoping that you could uh, sure. just briefly bring it in. That's a great question. I, I think you um, probably are reading a lot more than you're letting on. So it turns out that dark energy, it becomes an active player in the universe only in recent times. So after the, we think that dark energy kicks into form when the universe was about nine billion years old. Before that, dark energy was not dominant, okay? Matter was dominant. Remember, the universe is expanding. So something happens. We don't know what it is that causes this transition, that there's a transition and dark energy begins to dominate. And from now on, dark energy is in the driver's street, not dark matter. So early on in the universe, dark matter was in the driver's seat. 
and now dark energy has taken over. So what is the future of our universe? We have a pretty cold, lonely, desolate fate. So because the Hubble law, I told you the correction terms are dark energy, right? So if they become more and more important, things will be flying away faster and faster away from us. So three billion years later, a person who is going to be looking out into the dark sky, night sky, is not going to see so many galaxies because things have flown far away much further away. So dark energy determines, if you look at the future evolution of the universe, dark energy really does take over completely. And lensing has a way of getting at it, because remember I told you that the, if you can map the contents and the geometry, the fate is intricately connected. So if I can use lensing to determine both the geometry as well as the contents as we're doing now, then that automatically implies the fate. And that, that's where um, the speculation about the future comes from, from the current inventory that we have with lensing and the geometry. Of course, these are measured many different independent ways. So that's another thing about science that I should mention here, right? So whenever we are talking about some theory being ratified, remember that these are all pretty extraordinary claims, right? And so they have to be supported by many different lines of evidence, and they are. And because those are what I would call a, a theory that's confirmed. So we have many, many independent lines of evidence, some of which I didn't go into for dark matter. I've shown you like two different lines of evidence and the most powerful one being lensing. There are many, many indiv independent lines of evidence, both showing that dark matter and dark energy exist in the universe. And that's what I say when I, when I said, you know, this is incontrovertible. Basically, there are multiple lines of evidence that are converging in support. And what we are all looking for as cosmologists is one, contradict, one contradiction, because then that's not incontrovertible anymore. So that, you know, we're trying to rule out this theory. Everybody's trying to figure out a clever observation that could really kind of rule this out. We have not yet found a single observation that completely puts this theory in jeopardy. There are observations that we don't have good explanations for yet because we don't understand the physics well enough at this point. Uh, I actually had a follow-up question. Sure. So uh, earlier you mentioned e equals mc squared, and you mentioned that uh, mass and energy are intricately connected. Um, I know exactly what you're going to ask me, and let me tell you, it's a very difficult question. So what is powering? Where are you getting the energy? So when you do the inventory of the universe, that's why you know we should have guessed that, so people, you know, the universe is expanding, so what is powering the expansion of the universe? Where are you getting the energy from, right? Good question, we don't actually know. So luckily we have dark energy, and we think that dark energy is what is supplying the energy that is needed to stretch space-time out. Okay. And you know, the, the question is whether, is, is energy conserved? It is, energy is conserved in the universe. You cannot say that mass is conserved globally. You have to live, live and roll with E equals mc square all the time. Uh, at the very st early stage, you mentioned about the homogeneity of the matters in the universe. No. Is that scientifically proved or is that Yeah, yeah scientifically uh, proved. So for example, what, um, but remember I mentioned, so homogeneity holds on the largest scales, not on the scale of an individual galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. So if you look at regions which are much, much larger than our local neighborhood, etc., then we are mostly homogeneous. Very, very small fluctuations. But obviously locally there are a lot of fluctuations. So there are galaxies, there are clusters of galaxies, but on the very large scales, the universe on the whole is pretty homogeneous. And we know that now because we, what we can do is that we have maps of the universe. The universe, there's extensive cartography of the universe. And we look quite far out um, using surveys, which are called redshift surveys. And we see so far out into the universe that we start to see when the inhomogeneities really start to not matter very much at all. But when, you, when you're talking about the universe is, you know, infinitive, you know, unlimited, you know, you can, you know, test, okay, or, or, or 
some of the okay. Yeah, so what we can within do, that limit, but beyond that limit, you know, how can you say yeah, that? Yeah, so we know? actually know a limit. We know so there is a scale. There's about a hundred megaparsecs. So um, a parsec is about ten to the twenty-four centimeters. So a megaparsec is about ten to the thirty centimeters. So a hundred megaparsecs on that scale, the universe is actually uniform already. So if it extends beyond that, what, that's what it means. Beyond a hundred megaparsecs, everything looks smooth. If you use, if your grid, if the grid of your graph was 100 megaparsecs, right, and that's the smallest size you could see, universe is homogeneous. Of course, if your grid is smaller and you can see well within that 100, 100 megaparsecs, you'd see all the undulations. You'd see all the fluctuations that we see nearby. So it looks like 100 megaparsecs is roughly the scale. Um, if I could bring you back down to Earth for a moment. Sure. Um, we have a lot of uh, physicists and scientists in training here, and I'm wondering if you would say a few words about um, how you do this, what the teamwork style is, what kind of training is best for doing what you do, and then how you see the prospect for this kind of infrastructure being sustained, um, politically sustained, uh, financially sustained. Great. So these are. <laughs> I think somebody would have to clock me on this one. I yeah, can go I'm on sorry to bring you back down to earth. This is much no, more no, no, beautiful up there. <laughs> no, it's um, no, it's a, it's really important. So uh, first of all, um, so I'm a theoretical cosmologist. So I work actually in very very small teams. So this is uh, counter to how most of science is now being done. Most science is being done in very very large teams. So for example, the Higgs boson discovery paper had 2,500 names on it, right? I never write a paper with more than three people at most. <laughs> there, occasionally there are five or six because, when they provided the data. So there are teams of people who are running the Hubble Space Telescope, who are getting this data, who are reducing those images, and then what I need is a catalog to test my models. So theoretical people typically still work in very, very small groups. And the training, in terms of training, to be a successful scientist doing this kind of work, um, you need to have a very strong base in mathematics, physics, and computing. With, so the three axes that are really, you really need to work on. And in terms of exactly, exactly what I do, I mean, literally, I am, I mean, this sounds very romantic, but literally what I'm doing is I am chasing light rays. I am tracking the path of what is technically called a geodesic. I'm plotting every geodesic through space-time with a metric. And this is an inversion problem. So those of you who are doing mathematics, this is a classic, beautiful inversion problem that is under-constrained. So you know, new pieces of data are actually constraining your model. So I start out with an ab initio model that is based on the theory that on, of how dark matter clumps. So I make screens of dark matter for the lens. So I experiment with different screens which are taken out of these large simulations of the universe. And then I chase, I, I do ray tracing, that's what it's called for those of you who've worked on this, if you have. So I chase these light rays through the lens and I see the image plane and I produce what we are likely to have seen. And then I match that with what is observed in the universe. So it involves quite a lot of intricate mathematics and a lot of computing, but nowadays, um, you know, in order to do this kind of work in physics, you really do need both physics, mathematics, and, and computation. And I can tell you that it's a very, it's absolutely rewarding, wonderful career, and you can be successful. There, it's hard to get funding. So, you know, it's hard to get funding, and I think it's very, very short-sighted that uh, this kind of work isn't supported. Not, I'm not saying this in a self-serving way, because, Part of the work that I'm doing, so one of the uh, techniques that I developed has um, actually been adopted in brain imaging to make high resolution maps of the brain, okay? So you cannot predict how, and of course I didn't patent it um, because we don't patent anything. You can't patent anything on the sky. So even methodologies that have actually been used for this purpose cannot be patented. Um, but you know, so the, the rewards of what this work, the methodologies that are developed, where all they're going to be useful is not something you can predict. And the other thing is that nothing that you do with this kind of work is going to produce a product tomorrow, okay? It is likely, it has to be supported because you have no idea what this is going to lead to. And I think as a society, we have completely lost our way. And I, feel, I actually feel very emphatically sad about this. 
that we live in this short time scale, stupid thinking where, you know, manipulating numbers and, yeah, I mean, I'm trying very hard not to say that we are overrun by economists, but <laughs> people counting money and, you know, not understanding the value of long-range thinking uh, of the kinds of disciplines that need to be supported that are not going to give you a product. They're not going to add to the GDP of a country, right? Um, not in the short term scale, but these are what drive countries. This is what drives technology and uh, science and technology and basic sciences. And what is really sad in America is the fact that, you know, America used to be the leading edge of this stuff. And the, with the funding cutbacks, it's just really shocking. But, you know, don't be disheartened by that, right? Because there will always be universities, there will always be academic places and national labs in most countries where this work can be done. And you can have a very, very successful career. And you know what? You'll have a very happy career. You may not make millions, but, you know, we can't all want to make millions. That's super boring. Why? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't particularly care anyway. I mean, I think the kind of satisfaction you get out of this kind of career is amazing. But of course, you have to have a passion for it. It's hard work. It's a lot of hard work. I work very hard. You know, you can play hard too, but you know, you have to work very hard. Um, and, and I think that, you know, China is investing a lot more money. Um, China and India, thankfully, are now investing a lot more money in science and technology. So I think it's a wonderful career. and. Uh, you shouldn't be discouraged and don't worry about the prospects, etc. Just do the work and, and enjoy yourselves. Well, you just um, have enough of birds. Um, may I just, um, other than the real identity of the dark matter itself, what else are the physics that are we do not know yet. And how could understanding the dark matter itself lead to a better understanding of the evolutions of galaxies? And what could we know about the initial mass functions? Great question. Very, very good question. So aside from not knowing the nature of dark matter, there are many, many open problems. So this is another sort of response to the previous question. There's many unsolved problems. So we don't really know how galaxies form and evolve. We, we know by and large, we have a rough idea of how gas gets converted into stars and so on. We don't know the efficiency of that process. Uh, we also don't know, we know that every galaxy has a black hole in its center and these black holes are active for some periods of time and they're inactive. What we know is that when they're active, they dump huge amounts of energy because they're setting off these jets and so on. We have no, and that will heat the gas. But we have no idea of does it heat the gas enough to prevent formation of stars? Because stars form when gas cools and becomes very, very dense. So there are a lot of unsolved problems in galaxy formation and evolution that go beyond the nature of dark matter. In fact, we can make progress. We are making a lot of progress in understanding that we don't have to wait to sort out dark matter before doing all of this. Because the baryons, the ordinary atoms are not actually coupled to dark matter. The dark matter is only relevant that it provides the setting in which all of this action happens. There are many, many unsolved problems. And with a lot more observational data that's currently becoming available, you know, the models that are tight, getting tighter, more tightly constrained than ever before. And new pieces of physics, we're sort of getting a glimpse of new kinds of physics and new areas. So for example, one very, very important um, insight that has come by recently is understanding um, instabilities in flows of, so people were, and this came again from a completely unrelated field. So people have been studying how water flows in channels, how it flows through pipes and so on, and how the shape of a pipe and how fast the water flows, the composition of the fluid if it's not water. So in the oil industry, people figured out that there are lots of instabilities you have in those flows. And it turns out those instabilities were studied in astrophysics beforehand for cosmic gas, for hydrogen. And they hadn't made that connection. So now recently, people have made the connection that, ah, oh, the equations look the same. They're, in fact, they're identical. And therefore, the solutions that we've already computed 
in that domain translate to this. So similarly, there are domains from which astrophysics is learning. And one of the domains from which astrophysics is learning is calculations of magnetic fields that are tangled in fluids. So theoretical calculations of that are showing that probably magnetic fields are missing in our picture. And they probably are quite important in the universe. But we have no idea how to even think about them at this point. Thank you, Professor. Uh, may I now invite uh, Professor Sir James Merlis to present the souvenir to Professor Natarajan, please? Um, our honourable guest and college fellows to take a photo with professors. Thank you very much for coming to all of you and for the excellent questions. Thank you. So this is the end um, of our lecture today. So thank you very much for coming. I'd like to thank Professor Nashra Jen again for an excellent lecture. So I hope you have enjoyed your time here. And have a nice evening.